Say. 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 Takum. Say. 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 I mean, no matter how we flip it and rub it upside down, there's something magical, there's something special in the air when we dig on Tikkun Se. 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 And again, I love the way the uh, Hakan breaks it down, the Tikkun Meshe, Meshe. See the S-H-E, She, She, or Se. So say or she, like Shiv, like Meshia, she, or say. Love to Jackie say. Anthony, man. We're going to be digging on some Jackie Anthony links, man. We're about to get mighty linky, have a good time. Um, you know, I try to, you know, space them out, you know what I mean, these drops to where we can really absorb it, to where, you know, we ain't just bang, 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 bang. But then, you know, there's no real absorption, you know what I mean? Um, you know, just keep surfing the wave, man, and uh, see where the Most High has us on this investigation as we dig on the 1800s, man. I mean, so much is coming out the 1800s. We're talking about floods. Love to my man, Isaac Ford, man. I'm talking about Z. Man, Zeke is our music supervisor at 432 to Drive Radio. He's also a master investigator. You know what I'm saying? True scholar. And, uh, you know, we're going to dig on some some Zeke links, man. We're going to dig on all this, man. Because we're just talking about Takun. Say. 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 Lamb. We're talking about a sacrifice, man. Love to Jackie Anthony, man. This is from JerusalemPrayerTeam.org. So the she or say lamb is a young sheep or goat. It is most significant, the most significant sacrificial animal in the Bible. Let's go ahead and go crazy. You know what I'm saying? Let's let loose of all our so-called anchors and roots and all this stuff like this and float and be the water. And see what it is and what it's not about these 1800s, man. It appears to be prophets popping out, man. It appears to be prophets popping out of the 1800s connected to Israel. Sacrificial lambs. Man, don't this sound familiar? Don't this got a new testy type of sound? But what's the foundational legend? What's the foundational legend? What's the foundation that they're basing so much of this new test on? So much of the repackaged old test? What are the real names, man? When we talk about Abraham, are we talking Hawata? Are we, when we talk Abraham, are we talking Hawata? Because Hawata plays when we talk to Kum. Say. Say. Right, right. I mean, we're going to be digging down, you know, back in this OSB pretty soon to try to connect. Because when they talk about the Cosman era and this whole thing, you're talking about the 1800s. So this is written specifically to do with these 1800s, man. Iwata. E-A-W-A-H-T-A-H. Or Hawata. H-I-A-W-A-T-H-A. Hawata, a North American Indian, a kind of Abraham, a kind of Abraham with whom he was contemporaneous or contemporaneous, contemporaneous. You know, we're talking to Copper Colored Naga when we talk to Coombe, say that is the definition of an American, is the Copper Colored Racist family, right? What's the definition of contemporaneous? Contemporaneous adjective living or being at the same time, man. Same time. So if they say someone is contemporaneous, they're saying they're living or being at the same time. Got it. 
Got it. Because we're just talking Hawata, a kind of Abraham with whom he was contemporaneous. Or he was living at the same time as Abraham. I mean, let's investigate. Let's investigate. Before we say, nah, this is crazy, dry. What do you mean? That will make Abraham a lot more recent. That will make Noah not a lot more recent. That will make this whole Atlantis, you know, flood situation a lot more recent. And it might be pointing to one enormous catastrophe that's connected to this comet of 1811. That's connected to this, you know, massive climate change going down in the 1800s. This massive depopulation, which the whites like to just title Tartary. Tartarian. Well, have you heard about Tartanic? Because, yeah, we're going to have to get a little Tartanic y <laughs> when we want to talk. Uh... Oh, yeah, man. There's my drop, drop chatter. Chat to chat chatter, man. I'm chilling, man. I'm dolo. I'm in the drop chatter, man. Yeah, man. I'm sneaking up in here, man. We might have to get a little Titanic y. Tar Tartanic, -y, man. There's a group in Scotland called Tartanic, man. That's crazy, right? You know, the whole Scottish kilt, the whole uh, Tartan or something like that. It's one of the names of of one of these decorative type of uniforms, you know what I mean? Connected to this Scottish situation. All right, so there's a group called Tartanic, man. And they kind of, you know, put a little, a little hop. They, you know, they, they put a little hop in the, uh, you know, Scottish bag bagpipes, man. I mean, you know, we just digging on it, man. We just gonna dig on some tartanic. We just talking to Kumse the gold. Say, okay, okay. So the Old Testament say. Again, love to Jackie Anthony. This has everything required to mirror in the image and character of the Messiah or Mashiach. Mashiach, which is why Hakan calls him Teku Meshe. Meshe, Meshe. We're talking shade. The Lamb. The Messiah. Now let's just see how this all connects with this uh you know figure in history i mean they call this black history month i think we should talk about the copper color nagas don't you let's go man a lego and go subscribe to higher mark right now man because he got lots of drop on this teku meshe Oh, there's lots of drop on the Teku Meshe. We're just searching for black history, right? And yes, yes, you're hearing uh Tartanic tuned to 432 hertz, so you've never heard it like this before. We tune our music to 432 hertz, the frequency of water, so you're not only hearing Tartanic, man, you're hearing Tartanic tuned to 432 hertz, man. The nine, the spiral. Yes, man. It's a wonderful affair when you tune in and hang in the secluded alcove at the drop, man. A hop to drop nation. Ahab to the dragon sponsors on the wall, keeping our water flowing and our fire burning. Ahab for all the Yapa donations, comments, all the new subscribers. Ahab, let's go, man. Shout out to the home team. We're talking about a comet. We're talking about a dragon. Get parts one and two, man. Let's go. When you talk Teku Meshe, born in a Shawnee village in what is now Ohio. Okay. Tecum Se Sa Sa Se She became 
in the 1790s co-leader with his brother the prophet of a movement to restore and preserve traditional Indian values he believed a union of all the Western tribes to drive back the hijack to drive back the whites settlement to be the one hope for the Indian survival and spread this idea the length of the frontier the length of the frontier hold up man I think we need to get a little tartanic when we talk Tecumashe Seeing the Indians as the immediate threat, he allied himself with the British in 1812. Remember, the British were swarthy. All right, so these are some more brothers in Britain at that time. Assisted in the capture of Detroit and was killed near here at the Battle of Dames on the 5th of October, 1813. All right, so we dug a little bit on the Battle of of Thames. Battle of Thames, also known as the Battle of the Moravi Moravian Town, Moravian, Moravian Town, was a decisive American victory, right? Not the real American, right? Alright, right? I mean, let's let's be clear, because we're talking contemporaneous. We're not talking this American, right? We're not talking originally applied to the aboriginals right or copper colored races right so we're not talking about the copper colored races right now we're not talking about the aboriginals right now right it was a decisive american victory it wasn't a decisive abor aboriginal copper colored victory right nah this was the death of a prophet man of a priest king, man. War of 1812 against Britain and its Indian allies in Tecumseh's Confederacy. So he allied all the Nagas he could bring together, even the swarthy Brits, who many were also what? Connected to the Picts, connected to the same Hebrew tribes. It took place on October 5th, 1813 in Upper Canada, Canada. Near Catham, Ontario, the British lost control of Western Ontario as a result of the battle. Tecumseh was killed and his confederacy largely fell apart, man. We're just talking Tecumseh, the king of the woods. We're talking the lamb, right? We're talking the slaughter. We're talking the sacrificial lamb, right? Let go. The lamb, the sheep, the goat, the Passover. Whereas the ordinary ritual requires a young lamb, a sacrificial lamb on certain holidays, such as Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, Passover, must be without a blemish. The Hebrew word for this phrase is tamim, which also means innocent or perfect. Man, you're just talking Messiah, right? Mashiach. I mean, what does the name mean? Think baby names, man. What does the say mean? As a boy's name is of Algonquin, Wakashian origin. Come on, man. Love to Waka, Flocka. Who might know who he is. Oh, what's a waka? I don't know the flock is. But I'm starting to get the picture of what a waka is. Wakada. It's one of the names of the creator. You know, when it comes to these Algonquin, man. Wakada. So, the Algonquin Wakashi. Now, this Algonquin. Relating to Tecumseh and Hiawatha, all connect. We're going to connect this Hiawatha like we did before with this Tecumseh, man. So, 
you know, we, you know, you can look back at about a year ago or so, we done did some drops on Hiawatha, on Tecumseh, but now it's just coming right back around, right back around. Speaking of right back around, man. Let's keep that. Tatar. Tartar. Let's go. Tartanic. Tagum say the king of the woods. Yeah, man. I can flow with that. Now, this says Algonquin. I know it's small. It says Algonquin. It says the United States of the North American Indians before their destruction by the Christians. So, there was already a confederacy. There was already a confederacy, confederacy here. Not just those that are confederate against you, Psalms 82. We're talking about a confederacy of United States of North American Indians. Well, who's making them confederate? This connects back to the Iowatha. You see, Iowatha. Iowatha made them confederate. The kind of Abraham, whom these contemporaneous lived at the same time as Abraham. Let's go. Who made them confederate? Hawata. Also in Tennessee, you got the Hawasi, Hawasi River, right? How's this all connected? Now they say he's a tribe of the Moha Anan Anandaga, right? Anandaga. Hawata was a Mohawk Indian chief or the leader of the Anandaga tribe, depending on the source. Okay. He is attributed with having joined together five tribes to form the Iroquois Confederacy. He is believed to have been born in around 1525, but not much is known about him prior to becoming chief. Legend states that Hiawatha had several daughters. Now, does this sound like the Preston John situation? And an enemy of Hiawatha's made advancements towards his daughters. Now, this is around the 1500s. After Columbus sailing off and all this stuff like this, this is right in the midst, right in the midst of things. So now you got to compare this Genghis Khan, uh, Preston John invasion to this Hiawatha situation. Uh, he had five daughters. And an enemy of Hiawatha made advancements towards his daughters. Now, they're not, they're not naming this enemy, so it could be anybody. And that's why I compare it to a Preston John, Genghis Khan, Phantom and Duplicate type of situation. How this story is being told over and over again. Preston John. Preston John has these daughters that Genghis Khan wants to marry. Uh, Preston John, you know, turns down Genghis Khan's advancement on his daughter, right? He says, no, you can't marry my daughters. They go to war. So here we go. Hawatha has several daughters and an enemy of Hiawatha made advancements towards his daughters as each refused his advances the enemy killed them so this is a little twist in the story he killed the daughters one by one Hiawatha was devastated by his loss and went into the forest to grieve there he met a great prophet the prophet because of a speech impediment who does this sound like mesh 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 mosh meshe Mashiach, Mashiach, let's go. There he met a great prophet. The prophet, because of a speech impediment, was not able to convey his prophecies to the people. What did Moses tell the Creator? Uh, man, you know, I, I can't do it. It's, it's, you know, hard for me to communicate. Let's go. Let's go there. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me say this because we're going to get into this Genesis chapter 6. Let's just pull it up right here. Yeah, 
Exodus 3. All right, so you got the Moses, the burning bush. Moses was tending his flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of Hawah. There an angel or dragon appeared to him in flames of fire within the bush. So now instead of just thinking about some man with wings, you can think of it as a dragon appears to him in flames of fire from within a bush, okay, or a tree, right? Moses saw that the bush was on fire. It did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why does the bush not burn up? All right. And then he has this conversation with the creator. A while called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses, do not come any closer. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. I am Hawab, your father, the power of Abraham, right? And they say, God, we're not talking dog. We're not talking sinus of phallus. But we're going to get back to that on Angels and Dragons, part three. Let's go. The power of Isaac, the power of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at Hawa. And Hawa said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying. And because of their slave drivers, I am concerned about their suffering. So compare this story with what we're getting from this Hawatha. You got the you got the white settlements coming in. You got the invaders, the invasion happening. Compared to Tecumseh, he's he, he's the last of a dying breed fighting off these invaders. He doesn't want to see the suffering or slavery of his people. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians were, are oppressing them. So now I, so now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out. But Moses said, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And Hawah said, I'll be with you, and this will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt or slavery. You will worship Hawah on this mountain. And Moses said, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The power of your fathers have sent me to you. And they asked, What is his name? Then what should I tell them? And Hawah said, I am who I am. Or, <gasps> Wah! This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am, or Hawah has sent me to you. That is the Strong's Concordance. I am, I am, Lord, I am, Hawa, to exist. Hawa means to exist, primitive Hebrew root verb. Verse 15, Hawa also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the power of your fathers, the power of Abraham, the power of Isaac, the power of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. And he goes into, you know, go assemble the elders. All right. Let's get this next chapter here. Moses answered, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, Hawa did not appear to you. Then Hawa said to him, what is in your hand? A staff, he replied. He said, throw it to the ground. Moses threw it to the ground. It became a snake or a dragon and he ran from it then Hawa said to him reach out your hand and take it by the tail so Moses reached out and took hold of the snake or dragon and it turned back into a staff in his hand so imagine this as a dragon and it really comes to life man all right then he put his hand inside his cloak he pulled it out you know the whole leprous skin you know letting you know that he was melanated and this is what we're looking for. Moses said to Hawa, pardon your servant, Hawa. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. Come on, man. Come on, man. I am slow of speech. I'm slow of tongue. I am slow of speech and tongue. 
And that reminds us a lot of what we're reading right here. Let's get back to it. So we're talking Hawatha. He said, there he met a great prophet. The prophet, because of a speech impediment, was not able to convey his prophecies to the people. The prophet was referred to as the great peacemaker. Because Hawatha was a great speaker, the prophet enlisted Hawatha's aid and he healed Hawatha all of, of this pain. So what does this prophet have to do with Tecumseh's brother who's also called the prophet? Which reminded us before of an Aaron and Moses situation. And now you have this prophet. Could be the same prophet. Who knows? I mean, the fountain of youth is in play. Pastor John is in play. Let's go. The prophet was referred to as the great peacemaker because Hiawatha was a great speaker. The prophet enlisted Hiawatha's aid and he healed Hiawatha of his pain. So very similar to Moses as a prophet saying, I am slow of speech and tongue. And Hawa said to him, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? It is not I. Is it not I, Hawa? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. <laughs> And Moses said, pardon your servant, please send someone else. Then Hawaii's anger burned against Moses and said, what about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you and he will be glad to see you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. And I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you and it will be as if he were your mouth. And as if you were Hawa to him. Wow. But take this staff in your hand so you can perform the signs with it. He'll speak for you, right? Back to Hawata. Oh, yeah, we're getting tabby. We are getting tabby. So Hawata was devastated by his loss and went to the forest to grieve. There he met a great prophet. The prophet because of a speech impediment. So is this a situation of him running up on Moshe? Was not able to convey his prophecies to the people. Man. The prophet was referred to as a great peacemaker. All right, because Hawatha was a great speaker. The prophet enlisted Hawatha's aid and he healed Hawatha of his pain. The pair was instrumental in convincing the Mohawks, the Oniades, the Onondagas, the Cayugas, the Senecas to join the Confederacy, to join the Confederacy, to join the Confederacy. What Confederacy, boss? What is you saying, man? Man, I'm just talking about the Algonquin, man. The Algonquin, man, the United States of North American Indians before their destruction by the Christian man, it was already a confederacy. We're just talking Awada, who they say is contemporaneous with Abraham, but they're also saying may have lived around fifteen hundreds. I know, I know, I know. Timelines all crazy, right? The Dark Ages they call them is really the Golden Ages. What's really connecting with this Abraham and this Hiawatha or Hawada? Now you're going to see this name come up again in reference to Tekumeshe. I am slow of speech and tongue. Because of this great speech impediment, was not able to convey his prophecies to the people. So then they had a partnership. Then they started tribing up. The tribes shared a con constitution and were a democracy. All right, North American Indians. Let's go. The central tribe having the deciding vote when necessary. Each tribe lived independently, but the confederation ensured peace for all of them. This confederation brought together 
by Hawatha still exists today. And it's the exact same flow that Teku say or Teku Mesh is rocking with, man. So we're going to get more on this Hawatha because all of this really plays, man. Because this ain't no play play. This ain't no play play, man. Let's see, man. We got one more. Yeah, we got one more of these, man. Let's let's keep flowing with Tartanic. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Cause we just talking the king of the woods. Love the Jackie Anthony, man. This is from newspapers.com. Article about the coon say the king of the woods. Uh, I'll just lead you to the water. You know what I mean? But you can clearly see that this ain't no play play. Chief Tecumse Te was perhaps the most extraordinary American Indian who ever lived. Wow. Taking the great Ottawa Chief Pontiac for his model, Tecumse said about uniting the far-flung Indian tribes into one mighty confederacy. He would hurl the white man from the old northwest. <laughs> he would hurl the white man from the old northwest. He would repossess the richly forested lands for his red people. I'm right, talking copper colored novice. He would rule the country from the Great Lakes to the Great Gulf of Mexico and from the El Elysian Mountains to the Rockies to Kumse for a season very nearly succeeded. The American Indians had good reason calling him King of the Woods. The distinguished biographer Benjamin Drake writing in 1865 mentioned that he had a letter from the General Duncan MacArthur dated November 19, 1821 which contained this information went all the way from Greenville to Chillicothe, something like that. Uh, Tecumse pointed out to us that the place where he was born it was an old Shawnee town on the northwest side of Mad River, about six miles below Springfield, Ohio. Tecumse was the triplet brother of El Skawata, or that's who they now say is Ten Skawata, right? They call him El Skawata, El, El Skawatawa, El Skawatawa, later known as the Prophet. We're just talking prophets. And Kum Shaka, who is believed lived a very retired life. Now, this is interesting because Jackie Anthony left a great comment regarding this. And I'm going to get way more on these comments towards the dismount. Man, love to all y'all leaving these comments, man. Loving it, man. I mean, you know. It enables me to, you know, focus in on things that I might have missed or things that I need to, you know, definitely dig on even further, dig on clear, man. We're talking priest kings, man. We're talking prestors, man. This is why the investigation of Prester John is so important because it cuts through all of these so-called Indian chiefs as well. Because these are priest kings, which are Prester Johns, you dig? So you never stop digging on Prester John because... In that quest, you're going to find many of these Davids, and you're going to be able to figure out which ones are phantoms, man, which ones are duplicates, of the, and, and, and which one's the reality. It's going to lead you to, you know, the, the real spill timeline, man. Jackie Anthony says right here, Tecumse was a triplet. His brother, the prophet, known by some as Tenskawatawa, or Tenskawata. It's called El Skawata. Uh, the older or the other brother, Ken Hawa, named after a river their father died. So Ken Hawa is how it's said in this particular source here. Ken Hawa or Khan Hawa. Ken or Khan Hawa. This is a battle that took place, the Battle of Point Pleasant, known as the Battle of Khan Awa, Awa, in some older accounts. So the river is sometimes spelled like this with the K-A-N, 
A W H A or Hawa, right? Awa, Hawa, Ken or Khan, Ken or Khan, Ken or Khan. Only the only major action of the Dunmore's War. It was fought October 10, 1774, primarily between Virginia militia and Indians from the Shawnee and Mingo tribes along the Ohio River near Point, near modern Point Pleasant. West Virginia Indians under the Shawnee chief Cornstalk attacked Virginia militia. So that's another Shawnee chief under Colonial Andrew Lewis, hoping to halt Lewis's advance into the Ohio Valley. After a long and ferocious battle, Cornstalk retreated. After the battle, the Virginians, along with the second force led by Lord Dunmar, the royal governor of Virginia, marched into the Ohio Valley and compelled Cornstalk to agree to a treaty ending the war. They compelled him, huh? What they do to Cornstalk, man? What they do to the homie Cornstalk, man? Man, I mean, we just talking, man. We just talking this drop, man. Written in this newspaper, man. King of the Woods in 1934, August 10th. So again, it says here. Tecumseh, da, da, da. All right. All right. Old Shawnee Town on the northwest side of Mad River, about six miles below Springfield, Ohio. Tecumseh was the triplet brother. So here's another source. Another source pointing out that Tecumseh or Tecumesh is a triplet. So not only did he have his brother that they called the Prophet Ten Skawata or L. Skawata, written right here. It actually, it's written as El Skawatawa. Huh. You see how much the Y's play. So when we call them Hawa, you see that that is the tent peg. That is the sixth letter of the Hebrew. The Y is the foundation, is the vibration. Let's go. Later known as the prophet and Kum Shaka, which we just were calling Kan Hawa, named after this river Kan Hawa. It's his other brother. So this Khan Hawa is also being referred to here as Kam or Kum or Kwam Shaka. Right? Who is, it is believed, lived a very retired life because the forest Indians looked upon unusual happenings, happenings as having supernatural Meanings, the birth of triplets incited in the ancient village considered speculation and profound wonder. While the children were small, their father, a renowned warrior, fell at the Battle of Kenhawa. Here we go again. So there, here is called Kanawa, K-A-N-A-W-H-A. And here is simply called Ken, Hawa. So all that's the same. Khan, Hawa. Let's go. Khan, Hawa. Let's go. His totem had been a tiger. Mm. The mother's was a turtle. Tecumseh's own name meant shooting star. At maturity, Tecumseh was king of the woods. So we got this shooting star last time. We dug on these meteors, right? People are seeing fireballs all over the place. Just, just go on YouTube, type in fireballs, meteors. You're going to see them all over the place. And what does this have to do with the comet of 1811 or the Napoleon comet? You know, we're going to get into this atomic explosion they said happened connected to this Napoleon comet. But in reality, could it be fire-breathing dragons breathing down over Napoleon? You dig? Comet. Meteor, Comet, Meteor, Comet, <laughs> Solid Body, Like a Planet, Like a Planet. It departs into remote regions and disappears. It, in popular language, comets are tailed, bearded, or hairy. But these terms are taken from the appearance of the light which extends, which attends the, which 
in different positions with respect to the sun. Come on, man. Come on, man. Exhibits the form of a tail or a train, a beard or border of hair, beard, hair. <laughs> Comments are tailed. I mean, look, man, we, we dig on this, man. Meteor Beliefs Project, Elizabeth A. Warner, already told you about this in September 11, 2003. That the definition of a comet in the Dahl's Etymological Dictionary is a heavenly body, which in comparison to others is a huge mass, though sparse, nebulous, transparent, sometimes it may be seen to have a nucleus, while the surrounding area forms something like a tail, beard, or tangled locks. Alright, tail, beard, or tangled locks, a star with a tail, so... There was no, you know what I'm saying, breakdown for nothing called a comet, you know, before this 1955-1958 situation. You have this cometa. Let's see. So it says, Shrevnesky's Dictionary of Old Russian, which covers usage of the medieval period, has no entries for meteor or comet. It wasn't even put in these dictionaries, man. We're talking Russia, right? We're going to be talking Napoleon's comment, Napoleon's comment over Russia, right? Connect the Russian etymology. There's no entries for meteor or comet, but then later we're talking about this cold meta, right? And it has everything to do with a star with a tail, beard, or tangled lock. Star with a tail. Got you, got you, got you. So in 1828, comments are tailed, bearded, or hairy, right? Bearded or hairy. Tailed, bearded, or hairy. <laughs> Shooting stars, right? Meteors, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, fiery, luminous body. Appearance flying. Flying. It appears to be flying. Not just being, you know, thrown out and, you know thrown into outer space just it's a luminous flying tailed bearded and then that's when you just you know you know just 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 get a little smart you know get a little smart on them and you say oh so you mean a dragon is a fiery shooting meteor imaginary serpent so these comets that are bearded with tangled locks right bearded Tail, beard, tangled locks. What they tell? Tail, beard, tangled locks, star with the tail. Is the shooting meteor or the dragon. So, you know, get it like it's the first time. We, we, we can see clearly when we dig on the Prester John investigation, we know that in 1828, Prester literally met a meteor. So if Prester means a meteor, and we're learning right here that Tecumseh's own name means shooting star. Make sure you can see this. The goat. All right. Let's go down one. Takum saying his own name means shooting star. That means his own name means meteor. Prester. He is a priest. Priest is a meteor. Prester. Presbyterian priest is a meteor or a dragon. Meteor. Dragon. Star with a tail. Beard. Tangled locks. Got it. So we're putting it all in unison as we surf the way. At maturity, Tecumseh was king of the woods in appearance, if not in name. He stood five feet, ten inches tall, straight as an arrow, his muscles hard as flint, his light copperish coloring. Copper color, copper color, copper color. 
the copper color race is found here, right? The Amaru Khan, right? Come on, man. Come on, man. He's talking about the Amaru Khan, right? The copper color races. We're talking Khan. Khan Hoa, right? Khan Hoa. Copper color. Okay. All right. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> I'm on a war path, man. Let's get it. Copper color Naga. Intensify his, his hazel eyes, all right? Which look cheerfully from under the black, heavy, arched eyebrows. Determined, determination, not cruelty, rested on his finely chiseled lips. His forehead was high and full, his nose slightly alkaline. He dressed neatly, whether wearing his British general's uniform or his native deerskin costume. An eagle feather, white and black, adorned his hair, a silver medallion, gift of George the Third. Remember the black King George is still on the throne. Said Benjamin Franklin in 1151. But there's still a black King George. They're all swarthy. Suspended by a string of wampum. All right. All right. So it's going to be a lot of drop here, man. We're going to dig more on this King of the Woods situation. When we talk this Teku Mesh, man. Because it all plays. It all plays. I mean, they're all... They're all trying to dig on Teku Mesh, man. I mean, remember, man, what does it mean? This is a boy's name, Algonquin Wash, Wakashian origin. The meaning of Tecumse is goes through one place to another. So we got one situation where it's literally a dragon flying one place to another. And also you got this connection with this Mashiach sort of uh you know portrait that is being painted from going from one place to another an exodus right goes from one place to another every prester is guiding you from one place to another you know what i'm saying you're, you're getting out of captivity getting out the 440 hijack goes from one place to another that's why x marks the spot when you talk chickamauga and you talk this with the connection of Dragon Canoe, which could be all the same thing. Or just, you know, extremely close to it. And they go on this entire, you know, frontier. Remember the Chickamauga separated from the greater body of the Cherokee tribes. Because the other Cherokees wished to make peace with the American hijacks. Right? With the white settlements, right? So they wanted to make treaties and the Chickamauga said, nah, man, we out of here. We're going to separate. They were following Dragon Canoe. Dragon Canoe left a higher mark. Got the drop on that. Relocated, more isolated area. They established 11 new towns in order to gain distance from the colonists' encroachments, right? The hijack, they tried to get away. The Frontier Americans associated Dragon Canoe and his band with the new town of the Chickamauga Creek. So they were called Chickamauga after the creek, which meant River of Death, all right? and began to refer to them as Chickamaugas. Five years later, the Cherokee once more moved further west and southwest into what is now called Alabama. And you see the flag, X marks the spot. They're moving further west, southwest, go to Alabama. X marks the spot. This is connected with the same Tecumse, Tecumesh. From one place to another. The mark, the sign, the monument. The name refers to a shooting star. There we go. The star, the shooting comet, the dragon. It was born by a prominent Shawnee chief who, attempts, who attempted to unite various tribes, man. Bring the lost tribes together. If you don't think we're talking Israel, if you don't think we're talking Israel, I mean... Aqua Tai already told you what we're talking about. Where we at? Where we at? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. Aqua Tai already told you what he's talking about in this book. The history of ancient America anterior to the time of Columbus. Proving the identity of the aboriginals. Long title, you know what I'm saying? The life of Teku Mesh. All this is written in the 1800s. 
Man, we're talking about the Chieftain Teku Mesh, Tecumse. Let's go. Let's get it from here. Let's get it from here. All right. The ancient Hebrews. The language as uttered by Tekum say is not written by the pen of fiction merely to uphold the theory of the brain but gathered from the archives of a people's history to support the theory of the apparent truth the present writer would not yield to any man in the firm belief that the aborigines of north america and the ancient israelites are identical <laughs> are identical let's go because we're just talking about the courteous reader in tracing the fate of Tecumache, as depicted in the pages of his life, will not fail to observe the strong analogy between the religious settlements of the chief of the forest and those of the ancient Hebrews. Chief of the forest or the king of the woods? The chief of the forest is the king of the woods. The chief of the forest is the king of the woods the chief of the forest is the king of the woods those of the ancient hebrews so when we're talking about this incredible you know what i'm saying priest king this khan this tekum say this this mashiach together with a with the prophet right so you got the prophet tekum say then you got his brother called the prophet so like a duo of prophets, which they really were triplets, all right, all right? We're talking Khan Hawa. We're talking ancient Hebrews, man. So if we, you know, connect or try to draw these lines between this Moses and Aaron situation, and man, it sounds so familiar, especially when you connect to Hiawatha. This is, this is rearranging so much of the biblical timeline just to even look at it that way. You know what I mean? I mean, how many, how many? I mean, let's get real here. How many prophets do you know that were instrumental, this instrumental, in fighting the hijack and, 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 and gathering the flock, gathering the tribe, leading an exodus that were slow of speech and tongue? You feel me? Slow of speech and tongue. There he met a great prophet, the prophet because of a speech impediment. How many prophets got speech impediments, man? He was not able to convey the prophets to the people. So now you have this Hawatha connecting with this prophet that was able to, you know, speak eloquently to the people. So you start drawing these connections and it's leading you back to what? The shooting star, man. The comment. He held that all land belonging belonged to all tribes. All land belonged to all the tribes. And that none of it could be sold without the consent of all. So you can't just sell your land. Everyone has to agree. All right. Then the name appeared in the middle of a Union Army General William Tecumseh Sherman. All right, so somebody was named after Tecumseh later. We're talking the shooting star. We're talking the king of the woods or the chief of the forest of the ancient Hebrews, of the ancient Hebrews, man. I mean, look, man, you're talking Hawatha, a kind of Abraham with whom he was contemporaneous, lived at the same time. I mean, everybody wants a piece of Tecumse. Everyone wants to dig on Tecumesh. Yeah, man. Let's dig on Who made several of the world's most amazing predictions.
When did they build it? In the 17, late 1700s. Wow. And Tecumseh and was know, actually yes, in there. Yes. And you know, notice the door upstairs. Now, the only original piece out of here you saw over there, that leather bottom chair. Oh. So it's supposed to be a log house that Tecumseh was up in. All right, let's see. This is a pretty fancy cabin. Yeah. Well, he would have been a wealthy man because he had a wood floor and he had Yeah, windows. so apparently yeah. he could afford a design. Well, no wonder could Tumps fell in love with him. individual packs back then. There's a Rebecca Galloway. Yeah, she's from Tecumseh. Yeah, that's the one that was talking about. 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 I don't think so. But Tecumseh. Now she asked an important question. Is there a picture of Tecumseh in here? And we're going to get from this uh, following clip, you know what I mean, that there are no pictures of Tecumseh, you know what I mean? So you're going to see, if you Google it, you're going to be see a bunch of hijacking. You're going to, be, you're going to say, how they get that picture, that image, when there are no pictures of Tecumseh, apparently, you know what I mean? So let's go. So was in that building there. She said, when he visited them, she used to talk from the reading light. And he fell in love with her. That's what I read. <laughs> and, which is her love. And they try to act like, you know, these Galloways, you know, taught to come say how to read and write, and then somebody's going to correct them right quick, you know, about what's going on. You know, they, oh, he fell in love with, with this this lady. What's this two headed lady? I don't know what's going on here, man. Rebecca and Julie Galloway. Julia Galloway. Let's say Rebecca and Julia, maybe. Those maybe. are the Galloway girls. Those are James Galloway's granddaughters. Oh, granddaughters. One, so, of, a, one of them married a Worthington, a Worthington, Ohio. They have named after him. He was a lieutenant governor. Um, so she's not the one that taught. These are granddaughters of okay. the man who built that house. Okay. So, no, no, no. Uh, she's not the one. These are the granddaughters of whoever, uh, you know, Mr. Galloway that owned the log. All right, so chill out. It must have been his daughter. One of them died young and the other one married the. Huh. Uh, the Indians had Tecumseh been here. Yeah, well, that's... But Tecumseh was not here when they had their big fight. So, okay, yeah. lucky brother. Yeah, it was his brother who was a hothead. His brother was a hothead. His brother, who they called the prophet, named Prophet's Town, to the hijack, he's a hothead, right? I mean, I need you to see this clearly so you see how they do this every single time when we're talking about comets meteors and dragoons because the definition of a dragon is not only a meteor right bearded with tangled locks right it is a fierce or violent person a hothead a hothead oh he's a hothead you know they they would have been able to make a treaty if it wasn't for his brother who was a hothead I don't think they were interested in treaties. I think we're talking Chickamauga. I think we're talking Shawnee. I think we're talking Dragon Canoe. I think we're talking about Ten Skawatawa or El Skawatawa. I think we're talking about Tekumeshe, who they're calling a fierce or violent person. That's what the hijack dictionary is calling these people that are fighting them is fierce or violent. They are the dragon. Tecumseh is the dragon. His name doesn't doesn't just mean dragon. He's literally the last dragon, man, fighting this war. The last dragon who knew he was a dragon, who knew he was fierce and violent against the hijack, male or female, as this one man or woman, man or woman, man or woman. We're talking Khalifa. We're talking Sheba is a dragon. We're talking Miriam. Come on, man. I'm not talking Mary. I'm not talking Mary and Mary and Jesus. I'm talking Miriam and Joshua.
See, in the Quran, they have a connection between Miriam and Joshua. Joshua is the son of Miriam, according to that document. Joshua is the son of Miriam. So you see the duplicate between Mary and Jesus and Miriam and Joshua. Come on. Do you see clearly from a dragonfly perspective? Let's get a couple more minutes. I'm going to let it go. Yeah, it's been a, a little while ago. Yeah, I guess Harrison wasn't that big a fighter. He just <laughs> happened to come at the time when <laughs> yeah, he could yeah. wipe out the Indians. Wipe out the Indians. So this is where the battlefield is supposed to be taking place in 1811. One of them, I think the Battle of the uh, Tip of Canoe. Let's go. Yeah. Tecumseh was a... Again, love to hire Mark, breaking all this down. Go subscribe to hire Mark. Let's get it. A, a peace-loving Indian. He, he would have bargained and, and you know, but uh, his brother was a hothead. And, uh... <laughs> so Tecumseh would have bargained, but his brother was a hothead. You think Tecumseh was, uh, you know, a hijack or a hijack slave? You know what I'm saying? This hothead business is crazy. That's... That's history. Oh. Now, where's this place that Tecumseh used to talk to the people? That's over here. We'll go by there as we leave here. Oh, this is beautiful. By the time we get over there, it may be getting too dark to take pictures. Though. Oh, I can take pictures in the dark. See, the Indian loss is unknown. They don't know. Yeah. Die. Look, is that? The Indian loss is unknown. Who knows how many Nagas fell fighting for freedom? Harrison? Uh, yeah. That's him. Did he really look like that? I wonder. Look at the giant phallus up there, right? That's just a big phallus, right? Sign of the phallus. As I understood it. See? You got a big valley. Uh huh. And are the army? I forget which way it is now. We'll have to read that tomorrow. But anyway, this big valley here just made for, you know, a tremendous area to fight in. So the Indians were camped right here. Mm -hmm. And then the white people came. From... Yeah, that's the way I am. <laughs> and then the whites came. I bet yeah. I remember. Oh, yeah. They were camping, man. They were camped out. I mean, this is how the whites did business. They just like to do su surprise attacks. You know what I mean? The old, the old Confederacy would be like, "Look, man, if you want to do war, we'll do it on this day at this time. We'll make it, you know, on these grounds. Let's go. Let's let's do a fair. Let's catch a fair one. You want to get a fair one? Let's catch a fair one. The whites will poison you first. You know what I'm saying? You know, do all kinds of, you know, infiltrating, all kinds of shady shit. You know, do treaties, turn niggas against each other. All, all of this little shit has nothing to do with real battle. You know what I mean? This is just how the, you know, folks that got no sense of, you know, dignity, morale, you know, got no real pride in, in, in their warriorship, you know. They just do all the unthinkable things, you know, that have nothing to do with, with trust or loyalty or, or, or honor. They don't fight honorable battles. These people were camping out and got rolled up on. This is the image they keep giving you, right? This is the proxy. And there's nothing against anybody who's looking like this, but this is what they keep pushing on us. The indigenous, the Negro, the Hebrew, the Israelite, they keep putting these images on us. When you're going to hear from this next clip, they ain't got no images, man. Let's keep it moving, man. Love to a uh, winning video, winning vid. Let's go. This is about a couple minutes. Let's get this one, man. Hey, guys. Welcome to Hip History. Do you have a Native American gangster hero? 
Of course you do. Who doesn't have a Native American gangster hero? I have one, and I'd like to tell you about him in the next few minutes and encourage you to get your own. Uh, my guy's name is Tecum Say. I'd like to tell you about Tecum Say and about Tecum Say's curse, which some people believe is responsible for the death of, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six American presidents. Dang. Here's these images again. We're going to hear in this next clip that there's no images of him. So why do they keep, who, who's this guy? Who's this turkey? Who's this turkey? If there's no images of this Mashiach. Alright, short story here, guys. 1768. There's a great Native American future leader born in the northwest of the American colonies. And his name, they're not colonies, they were back then. And his name was Tecumse. Tecumse was a member of the Shawnee tribe. And the Shawnee tribe early on aligned themselves with the British. This is right before the Revolutionary War. And uh, because of that um, and the Revolutionary War, they're going to be on the losing stick of this equation because manifest destiny is coming. And they're ancestral lands of Indiana and Ohio by out of my way red man here comes their guy you know 1780s 1790s is quickly being gobbled up my manifest destiny so uh Tecumse and his brother uh Tenswatawa I'm gonna mispronounce that but that's a great name Tenswatawa oh that's awesome are really kind of seen as the opposition to um to, to the white settlers, to the American government. There were another, you know. So they were the ultimate opposition to the whites. W-I-G-H-T, which means demon. Native American tribes that are more compromising, that are accommodating, that are giving up some of their culture for self-survival, becoming farmers and moving on reservations. But Tecumse is going to have none of this. So um, right around, let's see. Uh, Hijack free. 1806, 1807, there starts to be some major shifting with treaties going on in that area. And uh, Tecumse, he is not down with this. So as uh, William Henry Harrison gets ready to sign what's the Fort Wayne Treaty with the Shawnee and really begin to gobble up all of that land for the white settlers. And the Treaty of Fort Wayne is really kind of a robbing deal. Um, it is uh, with a bunch of drunk Native Americans and it's done in the middle of the night without, you know, without the correct representation. And the treaty basically robs the Native Americans of their land. So now uh, Tecumse is... Uh, kind of, you know, in a bind. The brother, the great prophet, is uh, kind of the soothsayer. He's going to stay in Prophetstown. Now you know why it's called Prophetstown. And kind of tell these stories of kind of a Native American renaissance, like a new nation forming of kind of all of these lost tribes coming together. And who? Of all the who? Of kind of all of these lost tribes coming together and kind of who? Renaissance, like a new nation forming of kind of all of these lost tribes coming together. Lost tribes of israel you just saw we just got aqua tide battle just dropped the drop when it comes to the lost tribes having to do with tecum say we're talking to say 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 chief of the forest of the ancient hebrews remember people we have a firm belief here that the aborigines of North America and the ancient Israelites are identical. So don't get it twisted when this man is telling you about the lost tribes coming together and the Mashiach bringing them together. Of kind of a Native American renaissance, like a new nation forming of kind of all of these lost tribes coming together and kind of, you know, owning the land together because owning the land was nothing that they've ever really considered. So this would be a way. Do you consider it now when we say, look into it, own land with your neighbor, own land with your brothers, start putting it together, be confederate against the hijack? Way that they could unite and they could take the land and they could have it kind of for their own peoples. Um, Tecumse is the warrior. So he goes out on a warrior mission. This is like 1808. On a war path. 1809, 1810, and he ends up going down to the creeks or the Cherokees down, like in Georgia. And down there, he starts to round up these kind of, you know, resistance fighters of other Native Americans, 
And uh, I don't know why I got a Russian accent in there, but they were called the Red Sticks. Oh, you put the Russia in there for a reason. Let's go. So when they're down there doing that, that's when William Henry Harrison attacks. He attacks at Tipping, Tippecanoe, um, and he basically, you know, breaks up Prophetstown and, um, you know, uh, breaks up the resistance. So right around the same time, we kick it in with the War of 1812, and that eventually is going to be the downfall of Tecumseh. Tecumseh is going to, again, align with the wrong side, the British, and he ends up dying... Again, a lie with the wrong side. I mean, how are you going to tell this man he allied with the wrong side? He should have allied with who? At the uh, hands of William Henry Harrison. I don't know about... He should have allied with, with Harrison. He should have allied with, with, with the white settlements, with the, with the white invaders, or with the, with the uh, you know what I'm saying, you know, <laughs> sinusophilus, dog-headed people. Who should he have allied with? You gonna give this man advice on allies? He ends up dying at the uh, hands of William Henry Harrison. I don't know about personally, but from his uh, his forces at the Battle of Detroit, where the Americans are victorious in the War of 1812. All right, let's get the drop. Uh, but the story is, is that this is where kind of the, the interesting folklore comes in, that uh, Tecumseh's brother, um, the great prophet, supposedly cursed the United States because of its actions. And uh, that curse was that every president that was born um, with a zero at the end of the year uh -oh. would die in office. Uh -oh. So it starts in 1840 with the uh, election of, guess who? William Henry Harrison. How's that for a story? And William Henry Harrison uh, didn't wear a coat during his inauguration. So he died, I think, like three, four, five weeks later. So chalk that up to one for the curse. Um, and I'd stop there and I'd call it nonsensical and it's not even worth going on if I can't go five more rounds. So let's go five more rounds, right? We have 1860, Abraham Lincoln, 1880, James Garfield, uh, 1900, William McKinley, 1920, William <coughs> Harding, and uh, 1940, FDR dies in office as well. So this is a curse related to this prophet, this Mashiach, that any of these hijacks, you know, calling themselves presidents of this colonial corporation, something about a year ending in the last uh, digit zero, right? So you got all these situations, and I'm just saying, don't we got an election coming up, 2020? All right, how is this affected? How is this affected, man? So, you know, dig on this. That's what they're calling Tecumseh's curse. I didn't make it up. It's what they're calling it. And what about this image thing? Can we keep seeing these images? No pictures were ever made of him during his lifetime. Wow, that was in the first four seconds. No pictures were ever made of him during his lifetime. One more time. No pictures were ever made of him during his lifetime. No pictures were ever made of him during his lifetime. No pictures were ever made of him during his lifetime. Well, that's funny because they keep giving me all these images, man. Images, images, images. Where's this, uh, uh, pull up some, uh, all these doggone images, man. Let me check this one, man. Let me do it like this, man. I am slow of speech and tongue, man. Just, just put it into, to Google in Google. images all right so this is what they keep putting on us right we're gonna talk about this cat right here who uh you know definitely hijacked the homie uh tekumash you did but you know these are all the images you're gonna get you know hijack 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 and it's only hijack because they're literally hijacking us with these images you know what i mean it doesn't mean that uh because you look a certain way, you're a hijack. Oh, no, I'm just saying when you are claiming to be a people, but yet you are not a people claiming to be a people, and you have to write yourself into history, 
and these are the images everywhere that's a part of the machine pushing it on you and me and we are in the middle of a hijack especially when it's pretty clear and pretty known that what no pictures were ever made of him during his lifetime no pictures no image. no account in his own words was left behind no account in his own words were even left behind Looking back, the movement he led would seem in many ways to have been doomed to failure from the start. And yet, in the course of his breathtakingly brief and meteoric career, he would rise to become one of the greatest Native American leaders of all time, and one of the most gifted, far-sighted, revered, and inspiring, forging from the glowing embers of his younger brother's soaring vision an extraordinary coalition, and orchestrating the most ambitious pan-Indian resistance movement ever mounted on the North American continent. I mean, to be Shawnee and to have to come see you be a member of that tribe is to be honored, to be honored to be in that tribe. He and his brother, you know, was trying to get the Shawnee people back to their roots and try to keep their, their lands from being taken. He was a visionary. And I, I think today, what would have happened if he had succeeded in, you know, his plan? It would have changed history. He had a vision to make sure the Indian way of life was going to continue at whatever cost. This is a man, an Indian man, a self-proclaimed leader, a self-proclaimed chief, who stood up and said, hey, this is enough. I don't want no more of this. You've taken enough. And he took a stand. So those were absentee. <laughs> absentee Shawnees. Absent of what? Absent of actual being the Shawnee. The, the copper color Shawnee that we're talking about. Absent of being, you know what I mean? The actual foundation of what we're talking about here on this particular continent. Your historical, historical path, man, of the Negro, called the Negro, called the African American, all of them, all of this is hijacking your history. Oh, yeah, you know, it feels good to be a shiny. Come on, man. The real shinies don't even know what they are today. That's why they're absentees. Let's go, man. I'm on the war path, man. Can I get some more of them? Um, I might have to get a little bit more of that uh, Tartanic. Can I get some more Tartanic, man? Let's go, man. On the warpath, let's go. Let's go. Wow. So when you talk comments. When you talk comets or cometas, you know you're talking meteors or presters or dragons. Alright, so again, the story. In March of 1811, a comet appeared. Takum Se, whose name meant shooting star or panther across the sky. Sounds like the uh, Black Panther, right? was traveling throughout the southeast to build alliances with the tribes. So you know we're talking Hebrews. You know we're talking Israelites. We keep confirming that. We're talking ancient Israelites, ancient Hebrews. Hello, 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 hello. He told the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, Muskogee, and many others that the comet signaled, signaled his coming. It was reported that Tecumseh would prove that the Great Spirit, wow, wow, the Great Spirit, uh, 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 had sent him by giving them a sign. Shortly after Tecumseh left the southeast, the sign arrived in the form of a major earthquake. During the next year, tensions between the colonists and the Native Americans rose quickly. This lovely medal comm commemorates the comet and the coup set. 
So what happened with this explosion, man? I want to get to this explosion. And then we're going to get back into the Jackie Anthony links, man. Because America's been at war 93% of the time. 20, 222 out of 239 years since 1776. And it's always been starting out with these Chickamauga, right? The Chickamauga that did what? They separated from the rest of the Cherokee following Dragon Canoe. This is all connected with Tecumse. I mean, that just has to do with America being at war. All the way up until, so for the first 20, first 20 years of the hijack invasion in 1776 when they wanted independence, right? The independence of Black Britain. And now you got the 1811 Tecumseh War, War 12 Tecumseh War, Tecumseh War. All this has to do with the Tecumseh War. And all of this also has to do with the Tecumseh War. And that's connected back to the Seminoles. All these are Hebrews at war, fighting Hebrews, ancient Israelites, ancient Hebrews, ancient e Hebrews, ancient Israelites, ancient Israelites. Now this atomic explosion happened, right? In 1812. This is from the slavicway.wordpress.com. It says, we all know from the textbooks on the history of Russia that in 1812, the French led by Napoleon entered Moscow. The city was given up without a fight. It was a wise strategic plan of the Russian command led by Kutuzov. And while Napoleon Bonaparte waited for the defeated Russians to bring him the keys to the city and to sit down at the table in order to begin negotiations, a fire broke out, which almost burned down the entire capital of Russia. After that, the French army was forced to leave Moscow to run home by the devastated road of Smolensk, suffering enormous losses. So Napoleon tucked tail and he got the hell out of there. Because something was on fire. And so the myth of the invincibility of the army of Napoleon was scattered into the wind with the ashes of the fire. The collapse of Napoleon's political career began with that event. Who set fire to Moscow? Historians still argue over who set fire to Moscow in September 1812. However, we dig deeper. We would discover that neither side was interested in this fire, nor did it happen spontaneously because of natural forces and eventually it is discovered that it wasn't a normal fire at all there was nothing normal about this fire all the current versions as to what happened during the moscow fire of 1812 are based on politics because of that the truth is very difficult to find we're gonna find the truth we're gonna get the drop but it is clear that neither napoleon nor russians needed this disaster maybe it wasn't an accident after all not surprisingly this the surprise is that fires in Moscow have occurred before and even just as devastating, but to destroy over three quarters of the buildings and kill tens of thousands of people, it was just impossible. For example, 1737, a raging fire engulfed the entire city center of the capital and was com commensurate with the tragedy of 1812. However, in all, only 90 people were killed in the fire of 1737 while in the fire in September of 1812 killed approximately 30,000 Frenchmen. Not even to mention tens of thousands of Russians who were not able to evacuate the capital. So it seems like something, it wasn't normal, it wasn't a normal fire, but it targeted 30,000 Frenchmen and some so-called Russians, right? And why do eyewitness Eyewitnesses describe this fire as very strange, especially strange appears to be the people who were at this time in Moscow who appeared to be in some kind of shock when the fire ignited. The French were no longer interested in the Russians and the last had no business with yesterday's enemies and conquerors. And why did people roam the capital of Russia like Samnabulis? Samnabulis. Right. Finally, Moscow at the beginning of the 19th century was already far from being made of wood. How did an ordinary fire wipe off the face of the earth three quarters of the stone building all the way to the foundations? Even the Kremlin was completely destroyed. 
So this is the fire that destroyed the, the Kremlin. It wasn't not even saved from the fire by neither the enormous ditches nor the wide squares that separated the Kremlin walls from the surrounding city buildings. The ditches 30 meters wide and 30 meters deep were so inundated with the fragments of this fire, so-called fire, that they were never restored. So, you know, they're going to get into these eyewitness accounts on that day. The dim sum illuminated Moscow with golden light. Suddenly, a second sun appeared just above the true sun. Now we're seeing two suns and all this stuff right now. It was so bright that it blinded my eyes and it burnt the face of Paul Berger, who was relaxing on the balcony. Our house and the roof began to smoke, and so had, so we had to douche, douse them with water and other estates which were closer to the mock sun fire broke out. So this fire or this comet was as bright as the sun. Wow, it was as bright as the sun. By the way, Napoleon apparently being in the stone building at the time of the disappearance of the second sun, second sun, did not retrieve a strong dose of radiation. However, he died in prison on the island of St. Helena, not of natural death, but apparently from arsenic poisoning. So Napoleon's death is related to this dragon as well, or this comet, or this second sun, you dig? Man, you know what I mean? So, there's something that wasn't natural about this sun, about this situation. We're talking the Tartary, right? We're just digging on the Tartanic. Now, those ruling Jewish families, one is said to be the Rothschilds, had a different enemy in those days, the Grand Tartary, the Grand Tartary, was said to be the greatest empire on earth at that time with a population of at least 130 million Nagas. It is also said that Moscow was never the capital of what Russian territory is today, but rather the only Moscovia, the province of Moscow. There is also a theory that Napoleon's true aim was to create an alliance with the Grand Tartars in order to take away the colony of India away from the British. So what's the truth? What's the drop? Because such a powerful alliance would create real problems for Moscovia. Moscovia. All this is Moshe. Right? Moscow is named after Moses. And the powerful Jewish family whose country of residence was said to be Britain. Moscovia could have created an alliance of its own. Moscow. Moshe. Moscow, Moshe, Moscow, Moshe, put it all together. Again, when you talk about these Meshiks, much of northern Russia, Moscow and the region, Moscovy, what does it say over here? Moscow reflects the old name, the old name, which is what? Mosak, possibly the Mosak in cultures of South America. And the now dead Mashika languages. So when you're talking about Moscovy or Moscow, you're just talking about Mos you're just talking about Mosak or Mazaka or Moses or Moshe connected to Mexico in and South America and the Mashika languages in Peru. So Mexico, Meshe, connected to the Meshex, which we got back in uh Josephus that there's a certain mark or denomination for those that are able to understand, right? These Mesek got a mark, a cross, a cross, a cross, a mark over this Moscow connected to this Mosa, connected to this Moshe or this Moscovy, man. We're just talking about the War of 1812, man. All these wars, Chickamauga, Chickamauga, Chickamauga leading up to Tecumseh's War. All is relative, all is lining up with this, you know, with this dying, this great dying, this climate change. So you got Napoleon running crazy. You got the dying of the Kunse. All right, here's a, a sculpture in the Smithsonian. All right. All right, we're talking about a sacrifice, man. The real Tecumseh was born circa 1768. He was killed in 1813. Tecumseh was a warrior at 15. 
In the fall of 1811, Harrison gathered a thousand men and when Tecumseh was away, made a preemptive strike against his base on Tippecanoe. And that's what we got in that video we just seen when they were camping out and they got rolled up on by these whites. While he was away, they attacked. After a brief fight, several hundred garrison warriors withdrew from the village. The so-called Battle of Tipper Canoe was, in effect, the first engagement of the War of 1812, man. So all this is connected. <clears throat> You're talking Napoleon's Comet. You're talking about this explosion connected to Grand Tartary. So how's Tecumseh now connected with these Tartars, which is now connected with this Napoleon situation? Which is all connected through this dragon situation. You got all these links. Pull them up, man. Strange story of Tecumseh's comment. The Black Sun prophecy. All right. And New Madrid earthquakes. The biggest earthquake in American history. So what's up with this Black Sun situation? Talking about Tecumseh. He's naming Shooting Star. All right. His brother, Prophet. We got that. Now check it. The prophet announced another solar eclipse occur. And so it did. The prophet announced another solar eclipse, man. So something to do with this solar eclipse. It should be added that the prophet had been in contact with astronomers who told him the solar eclipse would take place that year. A black sun. So it's not talking about Saturn. It's talking about this eclipse was said by the Indians to predict a war. So he knew that this cataclysm was on the rise, that this great war was about to happen, or really that these Nagas was about to get wiped out. That these Nagas was about to get wiped out. You know what I mean? So he was predicting a fall. Just like right now, you know, when all these comments and this great comment, we're predicting an awakening. Wars with the Indians and the British would rage into 1813 after the day of the Black Sun. Tecumesh and his brother, the Prophet, attracted even more followers. One of the greatest Indian leaders. All right. On November 6, 1811, Governor Harrison attacked Prophet's Town with over a thousand men. We just got that. And that's when they snuck up on Prophet's Town. So following that was these big earthquakes and, and, and all this stuff. And I want to get it. You know, uh, another drop before we get into this dismount, digging on some of these great links, some more great links by Jackie Anthony. But all these, you know, earthquakes and these cataclysms and all this stuff started cracking off, man. Um, you know, right, you know, towards the same period of time. Thousands of trees were floating on the waters of Mississippi as they approached New Madrid on December 19th. Three days after the earthquake, they found that the town of New Madrid had been destroyed. They dared, they didn't dare to stop and pick up a few survivors for fear of being overrun and they were without supplies. Most alarming was the fact that they had not seen a boat ascending the river in three days. They saw wrecked and abandoned boats. It was undoubtedly almost a miracle that they survived and kept on going. They tied up at one island and the island sank during the night. Their dog, Tiger, alerted them to the oncoming tremors So this prophecy of the Black Sun was followed by the devastating earthquakes. These events still make me wonder whether the prophet predicted the future or if it was all just a coincidence. Hmm. Well, I guess you could ask that about any prophecy, right? Oh, that's that's just a coincidence. You know, that's that's a question you could throw out there at any time. So, Dr. Hijack, we're talking about this Black Sun, which has everything to do with this eclipse going down, which was a sign of a war, of a war. Of a war. So you got Napoleon, right? You got Napoleon. He's getting dusted off. <laughs> Napoleon's getting dusted off by this by this fire in Moscow. Where they say it wasn't a normal. It was nothing normal about this fire. This atomic explosion. They're calling it an atomic explosion. But they said that why do eyewitnesses describe this fire as very strange? This fire was just ignited, the second sun, right? Then you got this black sun situation. All right, all right, all right. Let's do it like this. So 
So how does it all connect it, man? Isaac Ford got the drop, man. I want to get a few minutes of this drop right here. Isaac literally just dropped on us, and it might be making a whole lot of sense, man. Let's go. Get in the drop chatter, man. You don't know what you're missing. Password is 1234 to get through the dope. Cities in the 18, late 1800s and orphans and the repopulation of the cities and why I think that's going on. Let's get it like this, man. I'm actually going to pick it up from around the five minute mark. What's going on? Okay. where a lot of them were persecuted and put to death, I think that a lot of them escaped to America. A lot of them escaped over here. Because there seems to be a hell of a lot of Gothic architecture and Templar-looking architecture in the New World and in Mexico. So, why hide Tatoria? Because that's the thing, is that a lot, you know, they've gone through, and there's plenty of videos that prove that this existed. None of us heard about it in school. Why the hell not? What would be the big deal? Why would they want to make us think that Rome was this big, awesome empire, and no one ever heard of the one that actually was big and awesome? What's up with that? You know, the only things that I can think of just come from the word. Tataria. I think of the tartan, because I used to sell kilts. And that was a lot of fun. <laughs> Scotland. But the Scottish tartan. Tartanic. Or Tartarus. Mm. But cast them down to hell and deliver. So the hijack is saying that you're, you're in hell, right? You're a demon, right? The dragon, right? Fierce, a violent person, right? So... You know, that's why you got to know whose mind you're in. When they're referring to Tartary, many times they're just referring to hell. That's why they call you savages today. Oh, you're from Ham. You're cursed. Hell. Cursed. Demon. Dragon. Meteor. Comet. Let's go. For them into chains of darkness reserved for judgment. And did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah... One of eight people, preacher of rightness, righteousness, bringing in... Let's get it from here. Now she puts this up. You know, I'm just going to get it like this. She puts this, this up. This is her breakdown of her investigation. So this is somebody else on their own investigation. I love again to Isaac Ford. And, you know, she's breaking it down. These earthquakes, this reset, right? Reset in the 1800s. Something was reset. This is when major cataclysms is popping off, depopulation. But who's depopulation? Because we know that we're at war and they're over there poisoning us, right? So there's there's that depopulation agenda. But it seems like your dragons <laughs> and the Most High was also hitting them with these massive plagues and depopulating them. So when you have these plagues of Egypt, so this so connect this back with this Moses, Aaron. Or Tukumse and El Skawatawa, you know what I mean? As 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 these Mashiach figures, right? And then there have this exodus taking place. And now you have plagues for those that didn't want to let our people go. These are ancient Hebrews, right? Ancient Israelites. Now you got the plagues popping off. Now, now you see why this series is definitely going to be ongoing. Because there's no way we can ever get enough we can't get enough of of this priestly investigation all these are really pressed to john's you know what i mean we just label them different things but it's all about the priest king so you got these plagues earthquakes swart storms volcanoes plagues fires comets ufos right these are all dragons connected to the fire and the plague dragons connected to napoleon dragons during the revolutionary war love to miss d and the copper color awakening who gave us drop on these dragons during the Revolutionary War, 1700s and 1800s, on both sides. These Iroquois hatched about 32 dragons in New York City alone in one year. So 
1811, you got the Great Comet, right? 1811, 1812, remember, you got the Kumsay's War, which is followed by these wars everywhere, right? Year without a summer, ice, a freeze over. Then you got the Carrington event, which we're going to look into probably a little bit later. The interesting thing is right here, she says Atlantis sunk and defeated. Now, normally, I would think I would think I was going crazy. But you got another, you know, private investigation popping. You know what I mean? She's sharing her own investigation. And she puts this Atlantis sunk thing in here, man. And it's... Because <laughs> if I say it, if, if we talk about these floods and what's going on and how this, this how, how this, you know, Mashiach situation is connecting with this flood popping off. Now you got the indigenous writing about Cox, 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 Cox is their Noah, right? So it's not some, you know, super long ago situation with Noah. Cox, Cox is more recent and it has to do with a flood popping off over here. Now you got the Thoth tablet saying that he left left here, saw the pyramids sinking under the water, and then went across the waters to so-called Africa and, and met the, the hairy barbarians, right? But over here, remember the hairy barbarians, Sinus of Phyllis, Doghead, let's go, Anubis, over there, over here, you got Atlantis sinking as Thoth is leaving. But when did he really leave? When did Atlantis really sink? How does this really connect? How does it connect to the floods in California? I mean, come on. Atlantis sunk and defeated when? Around the 1800s when all these cataclysms was popping off? Man, love to Noel, Faye, and again, love to Zeke for this drive, man. I mean, you got all this connection connecting. <laughs> you got this great flood of 1862. And I'm just going to leave the link for you. I see this is only about a minute. If history is any indication, California is due for a flood of biblical proportions. That state's last now, mega flood is actually... I didn't even have to... Go, the, I didn't have to go that deep. I didn't have to go that deep. Before he brought, he brought in biblical proportions. So while we're trying to connect this flood in California... To the actual Atlantis flood or the Noah's flood or the Cox Cox flood. What did he just say? If history is any indication, California is due for a flood of biblical proportions. That biblical. state's last mega flood is actually known as the Great Flood of 1862. And the next one could occur sooner rather than later. I'm meteorologist Jason Myers, and geological evidence points to these huge flood events occurring about every 100 to 200 years. The Great Flood of 1862 wasn't because of an El Nino, but another wet weather pattern commonly known as an atmospheric river. And it's just what it sounds like. A constant flow of water vapor hitting the west coast, falling as rain in the lower elevations and snow in the mountains. This particular... So when you talk about the waters above, you actually have rivers above, oceans above. And when they're when these floodgates are open, oh boy. Atmospheric river walloped the entire coast and lasted for an extremely long time, from November 1861 to January 1862. However, the resulting flooding lasted well into spring and summer. Melting mountain snow and multiple heavy rains caused flooding from Oregon all the way down to Mexico. It turned California's Central Valley into an inland sea. Sacramento, the state capital, was underwater for months, and they had to move the entire state government to nearby San Francisco. It's unknown how many people died from this great flood. Hundreds of thousands of livestock were lost, and about a fourth of all the real estate in California was destroyed. Since <laughs> so... There's these great floods that may or may not be connected, you know what I'm saying, to what we're getting at, whether we're talking Atlantis, whether we're talking Noah. That's the hijack, man. You got this super flood popping The Chinese on. tales. Those are the Native Americans. The Sanskrit writings and more. We must begin with background information. <clears throat> if you didn't hear about Earth's weakening magnetosphere, it isn't for a lack of reporting. 
For years, we've known that our planetary defensive shield is fading. In the early 2000s, we had detected a 10% loss in strength since the 1800s. And in just the last 10 years, that number has raised to 15%. The weakening of our protective magnetic interface is hastening. It is fading faster and faster. After staying in Canada for a long time, she's decided it's time for a shift. So you, you're hearing about this shift, this magnetic shift, and it's been, this thing is moving faster than it's ever moved, right? It doesn't mean the ball is, is changing. It means that the magnetics on the plane are switching. The magnetics on the plane are switching. And ready to go. The hypothesis states that some of Earth's water had to have come in this way, and also that a weaker magnetosphere means more hydrogen influx from the sun and more water production, perhaps even partially responsible for those historical accounts of great floods. This was first shared in late July of 2013. Let's step away from that for a moment. NASA and other experts are gaining a clear understanding of how cosmic rays penetrate much more easily and to lower portions of the atmosphere than does solar energy. The primary effect? Clouds, clouds, clouds. A tremendous agreement in some layers of the lower atmosphere. Mm. Our weakening magnetosphere will let in many more cosmic rays. And furthermore, it's now widely accepted that sunspots or high solar activity decreases cosmic rays. In times of solar quiet, see an increase in galactic radiation. As we look at the last 400 years or so of sunspot numbers, we can envision an inverse sinusoidal wave line that peaks oppositely of the sunspot numbers. This is the grand solar cycle. And according to the people who have correctly predicted the power of this solar cycle, we may be due for another grand minimum. With their models running, shows between 355 and 450 years between grand minima, like the Maunder minimum, with observational data falling in the dead center, 407 years. So counting back 400 years here, folks, here we go again. Here come the cosmic rays in force. In terms of star water, weaker solar wind with a weaker sun might make you think less star water production. But the CMEs are what do the most damage, and it just takes one big CME from one big flare or one big filament. With our weakened planetary state, everything could change in an instant. Last minimum saw a strong magnetosphere and a more stable magnetic pole, so elements of a coming minimum would certainly be novel. Enough background. Here's the crux of the story. Another piece to the puzzle of water and energy from space and it comes from some of the top scientists in China working with some of the top scientists on Earth from the Max Planck Institute. They explain that during magnetic reversals, Earth's magnetosphere weakens and the solar particles pull more and more oxygen out of our atmosphere. The paper itself is about how the oxygen loss can cause mass extinctions on Earth, something already long ascribed to pole shifts for a number of reasons. So think about right now how we have less oxygen, less oxygen. When you're oxygen deprived, you're stupider, right? You you can't think like you normally could. You can't grow. You can't heal. Everything's different. The plant life, man, everything is different, man. So without your trees, no oxygen, you shrink, your mind shrinks, your brain cells will die immediately. <laughs> And what does this got to do with this magnetic shift and this super flood, man? So, again, man, a hop to my sister Jackie Anthony, man, for breaking all this great stuff down here. With this mount like this, man, uh, she dropped this push mata, push mat haya, ha, push mataha, push mataha. <laughs> they call him the hero of the Choctaws. Now, apparently, he had some beef. He had some beef with uh, Tecumseh, man. Push Mataha Hubi, commonly known as Push Mataha. His full name is said to mean 
and uh, his arm and all weapons in his hands are fatal to his foes. He was born in 1764. Uh, he had no ancestors. The sun was his father. The moon was his mother. A mighty swarm storm swept the earth. In the midst of the roar of thunder, the lightning split a mighty oak and pushed Mataha step forth, a full-fledged warrior. So he had no mother or father. He was just born through the thunder, man. Hmm. Who does that sound like? Especially against the Osages. On more than one occasion, he pursued these enemies far behind the western banks of the Great River. He thus became familiar with the land of Oklahoma and where later his people were to come. Knowing its value, he did not, as some others, oppose the removal of the Choctaws from Mississippi. Was that the Indians called him Panther's Claw? He was by nature a leader among men. All right, so what does it say here? General Sam Dale, the famous Indian fighter who heard Pushmataha's appeal against Tecumseh, declared him to be the greatest orator he had ever heard. The Indian's picturesque words for Pushmataha's flow of language was the waterfalls. Pushmataha was ever and constantly a friend of the Americans, so he was down with the hijack. Right? Said he was so eloquent and so convincing that only 30 warriors of these tribes joined Tecumseh. So he did a speech to try to convince the tribes not to unite right? and to dig you know what I'm saying, dig on this invasion situation because it was better for these or this particular uh, flow of Choctaws that he was down with. Look at this dismount like this. At a great meeting of the Choctaws and Chickasaws on the Tom Big B near the present site of Columbia, Mississippi, Tecumseh had an earnest and impassioned appeal and had almost won the day when Push Mataha arose and made his memorable reply which was so eloquent, so convincing, that only 30 warriors of these tribes joined Tecumseh. Therefore, when Jackson led his army against the Creeks in 1811, finally overwhelming them at the Battle of the Horseshoe Bend, pushed Mataha and 700 of his warriors rendered efficient and valiant service. So they were service, they were in service to the hijack. This is just one of the enemies of, ten, of uh, Tecumseh. Pushmata is perhaps the best known Choctaw leader in the 19th century, famous for negotiating treaties with the U.S. government and allied the Choctaws with the Americans against the British in the War of 1812. So they were against the Kumsei. All right, man. All right, man. They say he ain't got no parents. <laughs> he ain't got no parents. They say his name in Choctaw means messenger of death. <laughs> Love to my jigger. We were just digging on this angel of death scenario, man, in the, in the copper thread. And uh, yeah, man, his name means messenger of death, right? He was born out of this thunder. He was born from the thunder. All right, so dig on it, man. You got the links, man. We're just talking. Push my tie, tie, tie. With the blow of the brazen hatchet, Vulcan cleft the head of Jupiter and Minerva leaped forth in panoply, panoply. This is a beautiful allegory, but it is not as grand in its conception as that of the birth of Pushmataha, the son of thunder, who had neither father nor mother, but directed by the great spirit of thunderbolt, struck a giant oak, and Pushmataha leaped forth the young warrior armed and painted to go on a war path. To this day, many of the Choctaws are here to this legend, and though he died in 1824, they still believe that he was only called away by the great spirit for consultation, and that when plans for the future prosperity of the country and future mature, he will return against, again, teach them the arts of peace if necessary, lead them successfully against their enemies. A little cloud was once seen in the northern sky. It came before a rushing wind and covered the Choctaw country. Out of it flew an angry fire and struck a large oak and scattered its limbs and its trunks all, the, all along the ground. And from that spot sprang forth a warrior fully armed for war. So he came just, you know, ready for war, right? He, he He's the messenger of, what does it say? The messenger of death. All right, man. All right, you know, that's something to dig on. It's Push Matahawa. Or was it Push Matawa? Push Mataha. There we go. All right.
Uh, my sister Jackie Anthony's leaving us with these great drops here. The Astro Car Yum Vulgar Takum or Takum do Paro in Brazil, Aurora or Wara, Wara, Awara in Guyana. All right, all these names are connected to this flora, are connected to this vegetation. So she was just dropping <laughs> some vegetation that's connected to Takum, Takum. Let's go. <laughs> which is connected to these bay trees. All right, you got Psalms 37. You can dig on that. Hebrew word, so rendered, it's ere. Ere simply means native born. Bays, right? Now, how does it connect with the, uh, the moor, with the bays and elves? I mean, it's interesting. Like a green bay tree. Then you got uh, Genesis 6, 18, and she, she dropped it in Latin. <laughs> And here you got the word tacoon and tacoon. And we were just digging on that for fun, man. Just saying, all right, man, how does how does this connect with that? Then it's the 618, but with thee I will establish my covenant. My covenant. And thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons, thy wife, and thy sons' wives with thee. So now we're back to Noah. Now we're back to the great flood. We're talking about the great flood of 1862. We're talking about Atlantis. What are we talking about, man? But we're talking about an ark, all right, and a covenant that's being established, connected back to this tacoon, back to the Latin vulgate. Uh oh. And it all connects, man. Here's this great <laughs> stamp here, you know, Dajaja, you know, but it's connected to a to a Kitzel. It looks like a Kitzel bird here, you know, back to this Kitzel, Kitzel Koltu. All the same connection, all the same Joshua, Moses connection. It's a wooden pulpit decorated Mayan hero, Tacum, Uman, Santiago, all right, in Guatemala. So you got this Tacum connection with the artwork, with artifacts. And you know, you know, you know, I mean, it just gets real and real, man. This is uh, something that we'll pick up on next time called Carolina Bays and the Great Comet of 1811. And we'll just pick it up from right here, man. Let's dig on it, man. A hop to the real ones, man. Keep on flowing in the wave. A hop, Jackie Anthony, Isaac Ford, and all those dropping incredible links and comments. And let's get our dismount. Halahua. Revealed later on in this video. So, first, let's. talking the bay trees, right? Let's learn about the Carolina Bays. What are the Carolina Bays? It all starts in the 1930s. Uh, so during the 1930s, the first aerial photographs were being taken, and um, while they were photographing the East Coast, they noticed all of these elliptical depressions uh, all the way um, from southern New Jersey all the way down to northern Florida. But the uh, greatest concentration of these were in North and South Carolina and Georgia. And um, these are what is referred to as the Carolina Bays. So let's read a bit more here. And the term bay, it's actually in reference to the variety of bay trees that grow in and around these depressions. So you would probably think, you know, the bay is referencing a a body of water, but it's actually referencing the bay trees that grow in and around these elliptical depressions. Carolina bays, they're consistently oval in shape and occur in clusters, uh, with sizes ranging from a couple to several thousand acres, so they can get pretty, pretty big. Most of them are vegetated wetlands that fill with rainwater in the winter and spring and uh, dry in the summer months. Now, this is a big point here. Every single one of them is invariably aligned in the same direction, similar alignments. All Carolina displays a display of marked alignment in the northwest to southeast direction. And let me show you a graphic of that. This is just North Carolina here. Here's the state demarcation line. This is... We're just talking to Cara. Cara means black and Turkic. Turkish, right? It means black like Cali, the Kara Katai, who is Preston John. So, obviously, South Carolina. But 
they all have this same orientation. So uh, northwest by southeast. And here's just some of them that people are trying to figure out where they're pointing to. Mm. But uh, let's learn a bit more. Let's get back to the article here. Okay, so theory is what caused these Carolina bays. So in the uh, 40s and 50s, the speculation was that a uh, swarm of meteorites slammed into the Atlantic coast. But modern research showed that the depressions are too shallow to be impact craters, and none of them contain the usual geologic, geological evidence. 